In the distance, the larger waves wash up on the crater wall, much like the ocean surf on a beach. A brilliant 500-foot fountain with temperatures up to 1,200 degrees centigrade reflects from the glassy surface of the 400-foot deep lake. The fountaining action is caused by the effervescence of dissolved gases in the lava, released when it approaches the surface. This fountain is spurting from one to two million cubic yards of lava per hour. Changes in the vent shape and in the violent release of gas cause variations from the almost explosive spraying of lava seen here to jet-like fountaining as high as 1,900 feet during later phases of the eruption, the highest fountaining ever recorded in Hawaii. The solid crust of the lava lake continually breaks and huge rafts plunge beneath the molten lake. This continuous foundering and reforming of the crust occurs during both the filling and the draining of the lake. The phenomenon shows well the rapid cooling of the exposed lava surface. At the edges of the lake, trees and forest litter were often buried by lava. For some time, individual tree trunks give off superheated organic gases that burst into bright yellow flames as they explode from the surface of the lake. The more violent fountaining rapidly builds up the cinder cone behind the vent. Two miles away at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, a large steam and fume cloud is seen forming from the fountain. All of the eruptive phases ended abruptly with a lake level above the vent. Here the fountain has just died and an avalanche of hot cinder tumbles down the face of the cone into the lake. After each fountaining phase, some of the lava lake drains back down the vent. Often the rate of backflow reaches two million cubic yards per hour, or more than twice the average rate of extrusion. The returning stream of lava forms a slowly moving whirlpool, perhaps 50 feet across, directly over the vent. As much as 10 million cubic yards of lava will go down the vent after each eruptive phase. At night, this backflow of lava into the vent is particularly spectacular, plunging into the gaping maw of the vent, carrying with it great rafts of blackened crust. Large slides tumble down the face of the pumice cone, exposing its incandescent interior. These, too, are carried down by the lava, flowing back into the vent, presumably to be melted again. Immediately after the eruption ceased on December 19th, a yellowish-white cap was formed by acid gases from the hot interior. The tremendous fountains produced great quantities of pumice that fell in a blanket extending many miles downwind. Only a lonely, rather macabre road sign and the stark skeletons of trees remain in the devastated area behind the cone. The lava lake will take many years to cool. Although nearly 50 million cubic yards of lava lay in this lake, the summit of Kilauea continued to swell until early January 1960, when magma evidently moved into the east rift zone of the volcano as earthquakes began to emanate from an area about 24 miles east of the summit. The precise location was determined by means of this portable truck-mounted seismograph. Unlike Kilauea Iki, this is a populated area with farming villages and fairly intensive cultivation.
By January 13, the earthquake activity shifted further east along the rift zone, and a half-mile-wide strip of land through the village of Kapoho slowly began to subside. The village was quickly evacuated, and by mid-afternoon, the maximum subsidence of the strip, or graben, was about four feet. Here, the fault scarp along the south side of the graben can be seen extending through the village. At 7.30 in the evening, the flank eruption started. Through the center of the subsided block of ground, a series of lava fountains form a spectacular curtain of fire 3,500 feet long. Lava fountains up to 100 feet high play along the entire rift for almost four hours in an area about 60 feet above sea level and only two miles from the ocean. A rather fluid lava flow advances rapidly through a sugarcane field north of the village. As the flow moves forward, pieces of the cool crust break and slide down the front to be overridden by the fluid interior. The outermost vents die out as the molten lava congeals in the feeding cracks beneath to form basaltic dikes. The next morning, we see geological survey scientists making measurements of the lava fountains. The temperatures, measured at night with an optical pyrometer, were generally lower than those measured during the summit eruption. During the night and on the morning of the second day, brackish groundwater gained access to the underground lava conduits and great convoluting clouds of dirty ash-laden steam blast from the vent. Vents erupting lava are side by side with roaring jets of steam and some vents alternate between blasting out pure white steam and molten lava. Downwind, the land is being covered with a layer of salty ash. present a spectacular display. The river of lava, here 300 feet wide, pours from the erupting vents and slowly flows down the graben toward the ocean two miles away. Two days later, the flow reaches the sea and a large steam cloud marks its entry into the water. 2,500 acres of land, including all you see here, some of it fertile and highly cultivated with papaya, sugarcane, coffee, and orchids, will eventually be buried under lava from this eruption. of steam hides the massive flow front as it pours into the ocean. Jets of black sand formed by the rapid disintegration of the hot lava in the cold water spew out of the steaming veil. Fragments of lava continually roll off the front of this blocky or aa uh -uh lava flow as it builds up new land into the sea. Minor explosions send small projectiles into the air. After one week of eruption, the graben was filled with lava and flows began to spread laterally over the flat countryside. 
Here, an a'a flow advances through a scrubby forest growth. These blocky a'a flows are of the same chemical composition as the smooth or ropey surface for hoi hoi flows, but differ from them in that they're more viscous and form a very slow moving pasty mass. When cool, much of this a'a flow will consist of clinkery rubble rather than solid rock. This 15 foot a'a flow pushes relentlessly through a papaya grove on the immediate outskirts of the village of Kapoho. The fountaining vent is in the background. cinder and pumice have completely stripped the leaves from the papaya trees. The schoolhouse and other buildings in the village of Kapoho are slowly consumed by lava. lava river occasionally breaks through its natural levees. At dawn, a string of vents form orange fountains against a gray sky. During this eruption, there was deflation or subsidence at the summit of Kilauea, 30 miles to the west, about equal to the total volume of the lava extruded, indicating a close underground connection between the summit and flank. Other parts of the string eventually die, leading only a single vent, feeding seven million cubic yards of lava per day to the advancing flow fronts. Many visitors viewed this early stage of the eruption. Later stages were even more dramatic, where a single huge fountain over three times the height of the Washington Monument played hour after hour. Mountaining up to 1,700 feet high presents a spectacular sight indeed. Flank eruptions are generally of larger volume than summit eruptions. This one yielded 160 million cubic yards of lava and built up a massive cinder and pumice cone. By February 8, only a gas-charged cinder jet roars from the dying vent. And by February 18th, the eruption was over. Where formerly there were farms, now all is a barren waste, covered with tens or hundreds of feet of lava flows and volcanic debris. Some 500 acres of new land was made by the flows, added to Hawaii, where formerly there was only ocean. But the barren land is not lost. In a few hundred years, the rough lava flows will be covered with vegetation. And here, only one year after the eruption, we see a grove of weed-like papaya trees planted as seeds 10 months ago in the new pumice. The island recovers quickly, for here in the seemingly barren expanse of black pumice that fell just one year before, we see row upon row of cultivated orchids. Thus has the island been built up from a countless series of volcanic eruptions over tens of millions of years.